All right, folks, if you could please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Today we are going to continue in our sermon series, and we're going to talk about spiritual maturity. We're going to talk about what Hebrews chapter 5 has to say about the topic of spiritual maturity. Now, we've been walking together so far through a sermon series titled Grace of the Lord. Of course, the sermon series is named after our church family, Grace of the Lord Church. We talk about the grace of the Lord as a two-sided coin. We're trying to describe both sides of the two-sided coin. See, some people think in terms of either grace or lordship. It's either we're under grace and free in Christ, or we're you know submitted to a Lord and are uh, obligated to servitude, as if it's either one or the other. But the Bible describes that it is both one and the other. Um, so both one, grace and lordship too. Um, grace is one side of the coin, which says that, hey, we are under grace. We are uh, saved by God's unmerited forgiveness. This is something we couldn't earn. It's something we couldn't lose. And it's a beautiful thing because if it wasn't for his grace, man, we'd be doomed. And so, you know, we, uh, we just don't have what it takes to earn our salvation. We don't have what it takes to uh, enter into his holy presence because of the sin in our life. And so uh, we need his grace if we're ever going to survive. We need him to allow us in uh, because we couldn't enter in any other way. And so we're under grace. And then on the other side of the same coin is the lordship. Whenever we talk about we are under grace, the we we are speaking of is uh, those who have submitted to Jesus Christ as Lord. He is our master. He is our boss. He's in charge whenever we go to make a decision. It's uh, ultimately him who is uh, the Lord of our life. We use this word Lord so much in Christian context that uh, sometimes it starts to lose its meaning like it's a cliche. But really, if he is our Lord, we have to belong to him. He is our master. We are his servant. Um, he owns our life, and that is just it. Uh, so far, we have learned in this sermon series that an overemphasis on either one side of the coin can lead to an unhealthy doctrine. So, for example, um, if we only talked about grace and forgiveness, then it could start to feel like for some that uh, we have this license to sin, this license to do whatever we want, that grace demands nothing of us, that it is, um, you know, just a get out of hell free card and there's really no worth to it, that uh, it can be a cheap thing that we could uh, we could use as we see fit. Um, and an overemphasis on just lordship uh, we could start to sound like, hey, we earn our salvation, that it's a performance-based thing, that there's a good enough or not, that you can just simply fail so much that um, you're, not, you're not one of Christ's saved ones. And so um, a healthy doctrine has a balance of both, um, you know, grace and lordship. I mean, that is what the Bible describes. Now, we understand that transformation is the most crucial identifying characteristic of authentic conversion. We're being transformed into the image of Christ, one little degree at a time, and it's God that's working in us to want that change. Uh, so it's his will inside us desiring that change because other, our natural selves otherwise wouldn't even want it. And it's God working in us towards that change. So he's um, desiring it through us, and he is helping us and empowering us with his grace and uh, uh, to, to even accomplish that change. He puts his Holy Spirit's desire to change in us because naturally you know, we couldn't even want it. He empowers us to change because that transformation is out of our reach, though we do have to invest in the reach. You know, if there's 100 steps between us and God, you know, he'll take 99 of them, but we do got to take one at least. And so grace is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. A couple of weeks ago, I asked a question of our congregation to test us. So I want to see, you know, if you learned anything from that week uh, or, uh, you know, maybe ask it again for those of you that weren't with me. So let me ask you a question. Answer this one out loud. Does God accept you just as you are? Does God accept you just as you are? The answer is no. No, he does not. Now that answer might surprise you, but John 3, 3, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. One must be reborn. One must be changed if God is going to accept us into his holy presence. We learned last week that the problem with sin is that we all have it. 
We're all corrupt by nature, and it's impossible for a holy God to accept sin into his life. He just can't have fellowship with sin. There's no way for sin and holiness to be together at the same time. The Christian life is rooted in the life of Christ. At the same time, sin and holiness can't be together at the same time. Uh, God is unable to accept us as we are sinful and corrupt, because it's like saying that light has to somehow add darkness to itself. It's just physically impossible. You bring darkness into light, the darkness is dead. If you bring a sinful person into the holy presence of God, you know, we're doomed. It's not a a decision God has made. It's just a statement of fact is describing the problem. We must be changed. We must be reborn. We must be transformed into a creature that's compatible with the light and holiness of God if we're going to be rooted in his life. And since all holiness comes from God, this means God has to share his holiness with us, which means transformation from who we were into who he is being born again. That old self has to die, and this new self needs to be made. And 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So when I asked my question, and I said, Hey, does God accept you just as you are? Uh, Some of you answered, yes, he does, wrongly, but you were thinking about a phrase uh, that's tossed around in Christian circles, this phrase, come as you are, right? And come as you are, this is um, not a scripture quote. You can't find that quote in the Bible anywhere. Uh, It is a doctrinal concept that's accurate enough if we understand it in the light of what scripture does say. We are able to come to God just as we are. And I thank God for it. If it wasn't for that, man, I'd have been doomed. We don't need to clean ourselves up, start to change our behavior before we come to him. We can come to him absolutely ignorant of every sound doctrine, not a clue in the world. We can be broken and sinful and confused and lost and ignorant and unrepentant and just dirty, just dirty, devastated by sin and oblivious to the things of the kingdom. There's no need to clean up or start learning to qualify to come to God, but make no mistake about it, God cannot accept us as we are. We must be transformed into his image. We must shed the sin and, and, and receive his holiness. So therefore, if, if we know somebody who would claim that Jesus is their Lord, but they've not experienced any change, they're not born again, because transformation is an essential characteristic of Christian conversion. Now, this sermon series has never been designed to make Christians feel insecure about their faith. Rather, it is designed to see people get saved, and there is a demographic of people who are just the hardest to save. Those would be the deceived believers, the people who um, know enough about the uh, doctrines of the gospel and even agree to them, but have never really received Christ in a saving way and uh, have a false sense of eternal security. And so it's worth pointing out that we must all grow into spiritually mature Christians. This uh, idea, we we don't start out day one of conversion looking just like Jesus Christ. We gotta grow from spiritual babies to spiritual teens and to spiritual adults. And so the spiritually immature may hear some of these messages about lordship and think, hey, you know what? I still got some of this flesh to work out. There's still some places where I'm unrepentant. There's some things that the spiritually mature desire that I don't. And there is such a thing as a spiritually immature Christian, saved Christian. And, uh, and, and so all Christians are going to become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. And, uh, but we all start out as babies. So if you're a baby listening to these messages and you're new to the faith, that's okay. You know, no problem. Babies shouldn't be ashamed of being baby. Babies are a beautiful thing. Babies are precious and they inspire our love. And it's okay to be a baby if you're new to the faith. Um, the problem is whenever you know we're adults acting like babies, right? And so, don't be ashamed to be a baby if you are the age of a baby. But let's talk. Let's define. You know, what do I mean by spiritual baby, uh, spiritual teenager, and spiritual adults? Because we're all one of these three, and hopefully moving from the younger to the older in the spiritual sense. So, spiritual babies. Spiritual babies. What's a baby physically? Is a very dependent. Uh, babies dependent on their their parents or an adult for food. Um, You know, the baby won't survive if the parent's not feeding the baby. Uh, The baby needs every single meal to be, you know, spoon-fed or bottle-fed to them. Um, You know, if if the baby goes a day without a parent uh, feeding them, they're dead. They're just dead meat. And, uh, you know, they need their parent to do everything for them, to change them, to clean them, to 
to, to put them to bed, to absolutely everything. They're very dependent. But babies are precious. We love babies. Uh, no matter who you are, you just, you know, oh, you're, you're adoring babies and you're, you know, head over heels just in love. You'll do anything to take care of a baby. No matter who you are, babies are precious. Then there's teens. What's a, a, a physical teen? A teen, you know, physically looks like an adult in some ways. And, and, the, and the, what's a, another characteristic of a teen? Well, they often think they know everything, right? They probably think they know more than they really know. And they just uh, really want to act like they're more grown up than they really are. And uh, that can actually get them in more trouble than it is good. And teenagers are also capable of reproducing. Teenagers are, are now physically able to reproduce even if it is too early for it to be smart to do so because we reproduce what we are so if a teenager has a baby then that baby is going to get raised by a teenager and there's going to be some problems there compared to if that uh, person was a, a spirit uh, physically mature adult and then what are adults physically adults are able to be depended on uh, adults can take care of babies adults can supervise teenagers adults can can monitor behavior and are self-controlled enough to be trusted um, or at least healthy adults, right? And, and adults can reproduce in a healthy way. A healthy adult can reproduce and make children who can be raised up and trusted. Um, all of this applies to the spiritual life. This is all directly relative to our spiritual life or, or, or relatable. Uh, but, and we all must grow. And the spiritual maturity process has a lot of parallels with the physical maturing process, except there is one big difference. Time is not always a factor in the spiritual maturing process. People will physically mature at 60 seconds a minute, whether we like it or not, right? But spiritually, we mature based on our investment of time. Physically, you know, there's going to be people who uh, maybe they're older and they say, you know what, let's slow this process down a little bit. Let's take a little longer to get through the year. And then like, you know, young people, you know, like my little daughter, she's four years old. She just wants to be a big girl. She would tell you every chance she gets that she's a big girl and she just really wants to be older than she is. She would hurry the maturing process if she could. Uh, but we spiritually mature based on our investment of time. Our spiritual maturity um, grows, um, not by time necessarily, but it's more like exercise. We, and we get what we put in. In uh, 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can add to your faith by investing in these characteristics, these virtues. Now, we cannot add to or take away from our salvation, but we can invest in our Christian character in ways that include increasing in knowledge, self-control. So that's self. That's not something God does. That's self-control and so on. It's a tragedy when we see Christians who have been in the faith for years, but failing to mature or grow up in the things of the Lord. Just like it would be a tragedy if my little four-year-old girl was in the same place um, 10 years from now as she is today, emotionally speaking. If my little girl 10 years from now is uh, still you know, sleeping in a crib and using a diaper and using a bottle, uh, my heart should be broken. But right now at her age, you know, she's a four-year-old acting like a four-year-old. Yeah, she's out of the diaper and bottle, but you know what I'm saying. She... Um, you know, is acting like a four-year-old, and it's a cute thing for a four-year-old to be acting like a four-year-old. There comes a point where we must all grow up out of the essential basic doctrines of salvation and walk deeper into the life of Christ. When we're babies, it's okay to be babies if that's how old you are. It's not okay to act like a baby if you are older than that. When we're babies, we have it easy, don't we? Babies have it really easy. We're, we're fed without working for it. We're served whatever we want. All we got to do is whine enough and an adult comes running to give you what you need. Um, as we get older, our responsibility to take care of ourselves and pitch in to help others, that increases, right? Now we have to work for things that used to get handed to us. We got to uh, help out more with the chores around the house, maybe even kick in a couple of bucks. Um, if we allow a teen to grow into an adult without teaching a strong work ethic, we take the loss as parents because we've got these adult babies living with us who are a drain on society. 
And so it's important to invest in our spiritual maturity, and we can't expect that to happen over time because we got to invest our time in our growth the same way we invest our time in exercise. We get what we put in. Now, again, I just it bears repeating often enough that you know if you're a spiritually new to the faith, if you're new to the faith and you're a spiritual baby, that's okay. Don't be embarrassed. Babies shouldn't be embarrassed about being babies if that's how old you are. Now, babies are precious. And I don't want this to make you feel insecure about your maturity if you are as old as a baby. Every single mature Christian to ever walk the earth started out as a baby. Just like every single adult on, on the entire earth, we all started out as babies. And so it's okay to be a baby if you're just starting out. If that's you today, don't be ashamed for being a baby. Just be encouraged to invest your time in a way that makes the most out of your time. Because uh, you can start to invest today in growing into a spiritually mature adult, spiritually speaking. And uh, uh, you get what you put in. Now, I want to turn, now I had to turn to Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 8 and read what the Bible has to say about spiritual maturity. He says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now about this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But, so, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have, have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And so here in this context, you know, the writer is talking about, you know, the suffering servant Jesus Christ and his obedience to God at, you know, the cost of his own comfort level. And, and uh, then he says, but you know what? You guys aren't ready for this. Like this is next level stuff. And you guys are still on day one Christian stuff. Like we're still talking about trying to preach the gospel and obedience to Christ. And, and it feels like you guys are acting like spiritual babies when I feel like you're ready for something deeper, or at least you should be. From this passage, we can learn four ways to identify spiritual immaturity. And so let's take a look at what this has to say about spiritual immaturity. The first thing we notice is that spiritually immature lack a desire of God's word. In verse 11, it says, regarding the obedience of Christ and our salvation in him, the writer says, the truth is hard to explain because you don't want to hear it. Here's a funny thing about the Christian life. If we want to grow in our spiritual maturity, we need to spend time in the word. At the same time, the spiritually mature is going to want to spend time in the word. And so Christ's spirit will motivate us to spend time in the word. And at the same time, if we're not spiritually mature, we should spend time in the word to grow in our maturity. So it works both ways, right? You, um, The mature will want to be in the word and the immature should be in the word to get mature. And so it's a beautiful thing. The second thing we can learn about spiritual immaturity from this text, the spiritually immature lack a desire to share the gospel. Verse 12 says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. A growing believer loves God's word and desires to share that word with others. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, you know what? It says, teacher, I'm exempt from this because I teach a Bible study. Or, you know, I'm not called to teach a class, so this doesn't apply to me. I'm not going to be a Bible study teacher, so obviously this doesn't apply to me. Now, that would be the wrong interpretation of the passage. And, uh, and so let me clarify, this is not talking about being a small group teacher. It means that it's talking about being compelled to share what you know with others. And so the ancient church didn't have small groups. The small group is kind of like a, a modern invention of the church to address this issue, a, a lack of Christian community during the week. The reality is that, you know, Christians should be engaged with each other regularly throughout the week and not just passing each other's in the aisle um, on Sunday morning. And, uh, and since that was kind of the reality, we uh, brought small groups to the table to just get people together during the week and center that around the word. And so this passage is not talking about being a small group teacher. Um, what it's saying is that if you're not sharing the gospel, you're not as spiritually mature as you might like to make yourself out to be. 
So let me ask you a question. How many times have you shared the gospel or shared your faith or your testimony in the last month? How many times have you shared it in the last two months? How about the last year? When we talk about sharing the gospel, that's the message by which we're saved. So we need to know how to share the gospel message well. And uh, we talk about sharing our faith. That's going to be the deeper things, to go beyond just the elementary gospel doctrine and into you know spiritual maturity, you know things that have to do with encouraging us to, to, to live uh, in right relationship with God. And we talk about our testimony. That's your conversion story. That's how God has saved you. And, uh, or it could be the vision of the church as you kind of encourage people into the fellowship of the church. Um, either you could be sharing one of these things and you should be sharing these things regularly and often. The physically mature are able to reproduce and make babies. But before that level of physical maturity, there's no reproduction. The spiritually mature will hit a stage where we start to become attracted to reproductive opportunities and are drawn to those moments like two teens behind the bleachers at a high school football game. Now, some of you are saying, you know, already making excuses like, well, I'm exempt from this because my lifestyle doesn't offer me chances to share the gospel. I don't get out much, so I'm exempt from this. And if that's what you're thinking, you have not been following along with me over the last several weeks. I give you opportunities to share the gospel or share your faith every single week. You could be sharing the, your faith every single week. I have opportunities almost daily to share my faith, and I don't get out much either. You have opportunities to share your faith every single week, and I'm not kidding. Well, for example, we've got the care portal. where you, Whether you're donating through that or not, you could be engaging with foster families one-on-one -on -one, or engaging with caseworkers one-on-one -on -one, or engaging with first responders one-on-one -on -one, and sharing your faith. Um, we have the care call team where anybody, I don't care how old you are, what your mobility level is like, uh, anybody, any uh, spiritual maturity level, you can pick up a phone and call somebody up to offer them prayer and care and it's probably going to lead to a uh, a sharing of your faith in the gospel share opportunity. You know, there's opportunities we're giving you every single month with uh, our outreach events. Once a month on a Sunday, we go out and we engage the community. You can be sharing your faith with a neighbor of the church every single month. We have the community dinner where we're inviting in more guests now than ever. And uh, we have opportunities there for you to share your faith and share the gospel. And so if you feel isolated from community, you find it hard to discover opportunities, check your bulletin. Now, I'm putting multiple outreach events every single month, not to mention these one-on-one -on -one opportunities that are weekly with our care ministries and custom outreaches. Anybody sitting on the sidelines of the kingdom, watching everybody else expand the kingdom in this church, can't say it's because of a lack of opportunity. Hearing somebody make excuses for not sharing the gospel is like hearing an adult make excuses for still living in mama's basement without a job. And so... A third marker of the spiritually immature that we can learn from this text is that the immature lack a desire for deeper things. Verse 12 through 13 says, You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Milk is great for babies because babies need milk to live. So if you're new in the faith and living on milk, don't be ashamed. You need it. And my daughter was never ashamed to drink from a bottle when she was a baby, and neither should you be. Now, if you've been in the faith for a while you're, and you're still on the bottle, you look as silly as a 14-year-old with a pacifier, right? It's just silly. Milk is good for babies because it's already been digested. It's already been processed. It's served to babies from adults, and babies are dependent on adults. Spiritual babies by nature will be very dependent on their church and the teachers in the church if they're ever going to survive. But, you know, just like my little four-year-old wants to be a big girl, this person who's spiritually maturing should crave to go deeper. And, uh, and, and so as we're maturing, we depend on people to help us with that. And that's why I try so hard to connect believers to mature disciples in our church family. For example, every time we baptize somebody, I make a statement of commitment in that baptism. And we encourage the audience to come alongside the baptized. I say, hey, will you come alongside this person and walk with them to spiritual maturity? And everybody says they will. Because leaving a believer to fend for themselves, you know, ignoring them as a discipleship opportunity, is the same as leaving your baby to cry and cry desperate for a bottle of milk. Listen to me, disciples who are hearing this. If there's a disciple listening to this, you are responsible 
for the new believers in your church family. Just as a parent is responsible to feed their babies, you are responsible for new believers. As the babies in our spiritual family grow up, they're going to participate in the household chores of the church. They're going to share in the expenses of the church family. They're going to reproduce. And they're going to help babysit the younger ones. And just like my my little girl, she wants to be older than she is. She wants to be a big girl. And she'll let you know how big of a girl she thinks she is. As we grow spiritually, we crave deeper things in the Lord and desire to go further than we are now. Now, my little girl, she will tell you that she's a big girl. At the same time, she would take her bottle back if I gave it to her. I had to take the bottle from her. The fourth thing we can learn from this text today about spiritual immaturity is that the spiritually immature lack a desire to obey God. In verse 14, it says, But the solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now this says that solid food is for the mature, and from verse 13, we're mature in what? The word of righteousness, trained by constant practice to distinguish from good and evil. So think about it. A teenager or a child usually needs to be told pretty often what to do and what not to do. All right, some of you are thinking, amen. Those of you who are parents or, or you monitor teens. You know, you let them alone, alone long enough, they're, they're certain to get into some trouble. Maybe they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Like, kids need to be supervised and monitored. Even the best ones can't be fully trusted to supervise themselves because they're going to get, they're going to do something they wouldn't have done otherwise. A mature adult, on the other hand, can self-control and can be trusted to supervise and monitor the behavior of kids. So, you know, I get an interesting perspective on people from my vantage point. So I get to see some pretty silly things sometimes. I've heard a lot of people ask the question, right? How close can I get to sin without sinning? Like, what's the line? You know, how much of this can I do before it is a sin? A question often comes up with like alcohol. This is a common one. People say, how much can I drink before sinning? Bible says not to drunk, get drunk. It doesn't say not to drink so I can drink, right? And the question comes from the heart of somebody who thinks they want to obey God, but in reality, they're spiritually immature just for even thinking that way. And it'd be like if I go to my beautiful wife and I say, Sarah, how much can I flirt with other girls before you would consider me cheating? Like, can we touch a little bit or would that be cheating? Or what's the line between, you know, where's cheating really start for you? Well, let's define it. Just asking that question alone reveals my heart of disobedience, not a heart of faithfulness but a heart of disobedience. She should be immediately skeptical of all my relationships. And so if I was to go to God and say, God, you've told me not to cheat on you with alcohol. How much can I drink before you would consider me a cheater? You have just revealed your heart for disobedience, not a heart of faithfulness to that command. Oh, but Pastor CJ, I'm free in Christ. I, you're starting to sound very legalistic. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And so these things that dominate us, why would you even want to do it if it's potentially going to lead you to sin? For, I'll give you to you another example. I've heard a lot of people ask, how much can I do this before I have sinned? What's the line? How much can I get away with? And, but I've never heard somebody ask me this way. Uh, somebody come up to me and say, hey, you know what, Pastor CJ, I bought this packet of seeds. And it's legal to grow this plant. So I planted this in my backyard and I'm growing it. Now the label on the seed says poison ivy, but I've put my own label on it. I've identified it as something else. And, and so I'm speaking my truth to this um, packet of seeds. I'm calling it fun ivy. And so now it's been relabeled and I planted it and I grew the plant and then I cut it up into little pieces and I rubbed it all over my body and I am just now miserable. I don't understand it. I mean, the plant's legal. God made plants. And so, you know, I'm free to choose. It doesn't say in the Bible it's a sin to rub this plant all over my body. Why is it hurting? Because not everything that's legal is helpful. It's silly for you to do something like that. And so, let's review what we've learned so far. We all start out as spiritual babies. When we're young in the faith, there is nothing to be ashamed about. For the spiritual young one, be encouraged to invest your time wisely because you're not just going to grow up over time in the same way that you physically mature. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we can grow in grace, which requires an investment of our time. You want to grow in your spiritual formation, or you're going to look like an adult who still lives at home with their parents. Depending on adults, 
when they should be independent. We can identify the spiritually immature by four markers based on Hebrews 5. And I know there's more markers of spiritual immaturity, but based on Hebrews 5, one marker is that the spiritually immature lack a desire for God's word. John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So there's no such thing as a disciple of Christ who will be offended by God's word. A spiritually mature Christian will hear the words of God and will follow. The second marker of spiritual immaturity based on Hebrews 5 was a lack of a desire to share the gospel and teach what we know. If it's okay with you to watch everybody else in your church share their faith, then as it says in verse 12, you need someone to teach you again the basic doctrines, basic principles of the oracles of God, because kingdom expansion is day one stuff. Like this is day one stuff. So it doesn't matter how long you've been believing, you still need a bottle of milk if you're not doing this stuff without a kick in the pants from your pastor. The third marker of spiritual immaturity from Hebrews 5 is a lack of a desire for deeper things. A respectable adult wants to achieve, not coast along and mooch. A spiritually mature Christian wants to grow deeper because we're compelled to get as far away from that old self who died off when Christ converted us. And the fourth marker of spiritual immaturity was a lack of a desire to obey God. Just like a child must be constantly corrected, so the spiritually immature was going to make every excuse to disobey. So it doesn't matter how long you've been believing. If you have unrepentant sin that's clearly described in Scripture to be harmful for you, you look like a, a middle-aged adult wearing a bonnet and sucking on a pacifier with a big diaper. It's just silly. It's hard to take you seriously. The unrepentant Christian is like a middle-aged man who would rather sit at home playing video games than go to their job. You look ridiculous, and it's hard to take you seriously. You have no credibility. Every single person here can relate to our message today because either we were spiritually immature once or are spiritually immature now. No exceptions. We must all grow from babies to teens and to adults. And some of you, you're thinking, you're starting to realize that maybe you've been on the bottle for way too long now. Um, and so where are you in your journey? Are you a spiritual baby because you're supposed to be because you're new in the faith? Or are you a baby because you've just chosen not to uh, exercise your faith? Or are you a spiritual teen? Um, you're getting there, you've got a little bit of ways to go, or are you a spiritually mature adult who is reproducing? When a baby is a baby and is supposed to be a baby, it's a very precious sight. Their first words, the things they say, nothing inspires our love more. We're head over heels in love with babies. You know, especially whenever, like, my little baby tries to act like a big girl. There's nothing more precious as she's trying to be a little older than she is. But in 10 years, if my little baby's still laying in her crib saying goo goo gaga, it's going to break my heart. It's a beautiful thing to see a new Christian excited about the things of the Lord for the first time and growing out of worldly ways. But if after a decade somebody's still not sharing their faith and struggling with the flesh in the same way as they were in the beginning, there's nothing more sad. A healthy person is a hungry person, right? Notice like when you're sick, you're not hungry. But when you're healthy, you'll eat. You'll have an appetite. Uh, the spiritually mature desire deeper things and desire to be in the word of God. In church, I feed you. I deliver you a sermon, which is basically preparing a meal and cutting it up for you and feeding you. I want to teach you how to prepare the meal for yourself. And I want you to be able to eat it on your own at home during your God time. Discipleship is all about growing up. It's, it's about growing into the next levels. And we're called to make disciples. And it takes a disciple to make a disciple. So with all of this, what do we do about it? What do we do about what we just learned here today? Everything in the Bible is written in the context of relationship. The scriptures are not a bunch of religious rules. They're descriptions on how to invest in a healthy spiritual relationship and how to avoid damaging those relationships. If you want to grow spiritually, one crucial step is to surround yourself with spiritually mature Christians. Spend time together with other spiritually mature Christians outside the gathering, you know, recruit a mentor. Let that person speak into your life. Be vulnerable enough for them to see all of it and transparent enough and then just, you know, humble enough to, to accept what they have to say. Attend small groups. Go to a small group. If you're not in a small group, join a small group and, and, and commit to it. Be there regularly. And we also talk about the four G's a lot. Uh, that's God time, gather time, group time, and glow time. If you do these four things, you'll grow in your spiritual maturity. Your God time, that's 
time spent alone with God daily. That's you and the Lord daily um, in the word, in prayer, designated, dedicated time that you are not going to sacrifice for anything. You do this every day and just be with him, not for the sake of checking off the boxes, what good Christians do, but rather to enjoy fellowship with God relationally. And then there's gather time. That's time spent weekly. I'm gathering with your church family. There's stuff that God's going to do in the gathering that he's not going to do anywhere else. There's stuff that you're going to learn there you're not going to learn anywhere else. You can't stream this stuff. You can't download this stuff. It's that community that is a, a fundamental part of God's plan uh, for how you are going to grow and how he's going to use you to grow others. And then there's group time. Talked about that a little bit just a moment ago. That's uh, time spent regularly in a community group. Uh, with others from my church family. So that could be anytime you're getting together with people from your church outside of the Sunday gathering, like uh, small groups or potlucks or just hanging out with each other socially or uh, just uh, just doing life together with other Christians from your church. And, uh, and then there's glow time. That's time spent regularly serving and doing outreach with people from my church. Uh, getting out into the community, letting the Lord use you um, making himself, making yourself available for him to work through, um, is a great way to experience his power and surefire to grow your testimony. You're going to experience things there, the likes of which most people only get to read about. So if you do these things, you do the four G's, you're guaranteed to grow in Christ. And, uh, and so, uh, get a mentor, let them speak into your life, do the four G's, God time, gather time, group time, and grow, glow time, and you will grow. From wherever you are at, even if you're a spiritually mature adult, these things are certain to help you grow even deeper because we have not arrived until we are on the other side of mortality. So we all have more growing to do. Don't be ashamed if you're a baby and you're new in the faith, but wherever you're at, invest your time in these ways and you're certain to look more like Jesus Christ one degree at a time on that daily journey into spiritual maturity. I say these things in Jesus' name, amen.